Grace to you and peace. My name is Pastor Adam Snook, and I serve as an assistant to the bishop in the Eastern Synod of our Evangelical Lutheran Church in Canada. It continues to be my privilege and a real joy to participate yet again in our ELCIC Summer Sermon Series. Thank you for your continued support of this project and for your willingness to make use of these resources, resources that unite us as a whole church from British Columbia to Nova Scotia and all of those wonderful places in between. It is good, so good, for us to be together in this way. And now a reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. After this, Jesus appointed 70 others and sent them on ahead of him in pairs to every town and every place where he himself intended to go. Jesus said to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go on your way. See, I am sending you out like lambs into the midst of wolves. Carry no purse, no bag, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, peace to this house. And if anyone is there who shares in peace, your peace will rest on that person. But if not, it will return to you. Remain in the same house, eating and drinking whatever they provide, for the laborer deserves to be paid. Do not move about from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and its people welcome you, eat what is set before you. Cure the sick who are there and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not welcome you, go out into its streets and say, Even the dust of your town that clings to our feet we wipe off in protest against you. Yet know this, the kingdom of God has come near. Whoever listens to you listens to me, and whoever rejects you rejects me. And whoever rejects me rejects the one who sent me. The seventy returned with joy, saying, Lord, in your name even the demons submit to us. And Jesus said to them, I watch Satan fall from heaven like a flash of lightning. See, I have given you authority to tread on snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice at this, that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. This is the gospel of our Lord. One of the most common tidbits of advice that was offered to my wife and I as we anticipated and prepared for the birth of our son was the advice that we were in for a steep learning curve. Of course, they were right. We needed to learn how to soothe the cries of a newborn baby. We needed to learn how to encourage his growth and his development. And we needed to learn the what's and the why's and the how's of this new life stage as parents. They were right. It was a steep learning curve. But while some of these lessons were certainly anticipated, I mean, the art of changing a wiggly newborn really can't be learned from a book, other lessons caught us quite by surprise. We never would have anticipated just how much our capacity for love would grow. We never would have anticipated the worry we would experience as he bumped his way toward learning to walk. And perhaps most of all, we never could have prepared ourselves for the lessons that he would teach us, for the life lessons which awaited us in the years ahead. Lessons about slowing down and showing up. Lessons about finding joy and being open to it. Lessons about the value of laughter and taking time to play. And most recently, 
the lesson that anything is possible. You see, what I've come to celebrate about my son Nate now that he's seven years old is his unwavering belief that anything, absolutely anything, is possible. Want to go to space? Sure, we can do that. Want to build the world's biggest treehouse? Absolutely, I'm sure that'll work. Want to dive deeper than any deep sea diver has ever ventured? No problem. Let's do it. In his mind, anything is possible. His imagination is unlimited, and his willingness to give it a try is unwavering. When today's passage from Luke's Gospel, often known as the Mission of the Seventy, rolls around in the lectionary cycle, there are a number of expected details that typically catch our attention, don't they? The disciples being sent out in pairs, the absence of any sort of physical supply list, talk of lambs among wolves, and the shaking of dust from one's own rejected feet. Needless to say that any one of these and a whole host of others would certainly provide more than enough homiletical fodder upon which we might choose to chew. And yet what stands out to me the most, beyond dust-covered feet or paired-off disciples, is the promise of unlimited possibilities that flows from start to finish throughout this narrative. Just think about it. Jesus sent 70, not 700 or 7,000, 70 disciples into the world. 70 disciples to share the good news to the ends of the earth. 70 disciples to reap the abundance of a plentiful harvest. 70 disciples to proclaim hope amidst despair and joy amidst sorrow and life where only death was found. 70 disciples. And that's where I think we encounter something quite beautiful in this morning's timely passage from Luke. The promise that even when the laborers really do feel sparse, that the harvest, the harvest is still plentiful. It's the assurance that life still abounds over death and joy triumphs over sorrow. Hope still breathes reprieve to despair and the promise that the good news has, does, and will always change lives. In this season after Pentecost, we are weekly reminded through Scripture, just as I am daily reminded by my son, reminded of the unlimited possibilities of God, of nets filled and bread multiplied, seeds planted, people healed, sins forgiven. The promise of the seemingly impossible made possible by a God who loves us. It's the kind of promise that sustains us as we, too, are sent into the world to share that same life-changing good news. The kind of promise that inspires us to dream new dreams for God's church. The kind of promise that reminds us that even when the days are long and when there are no sandals left on our feet, or even when we're covered in dust from a long and winding road, that this work, Discipleship work, gospel work, God's work is still worth it. Notice Jesus never says to his 70 new recruits that go into a town and if it's too small or if the people are too tired, then save yourself the hassle and move on elsewhere. No. Instead, Jesus tells his laborers to give it a try to do everything that they can to proclaim the gospel, to speak the truth, to share the good news. According to Jesus, no place is so outlying, no house so damaged, no person so tired, that they are unworthy of the hope that comes from the love of our Savior. And if things don't go according to plan, Jesus says, after having given it your best, after you've planted seeds and tilled soil, then shake the dust from your feet, move on and, and try again. Knowing all the while that the seeds you have planted, the soil you've tilled, 
is still being tended by God, that God's not done yet. And this work, this gospel-bearing, discipleship-living, good news-sharing work that we have been called, commissioned, equipped, and sent to do is still possible, even and especially today. For the sake of all those who need to hear a word of love and forgiveness in their daily lives. For the sake of all those who need to be consoled and comforted. For the sake of all those who are imprisoned or enslaved. For the sake of all those who feel excluded, judged, rejected. For the sake of all those who yearn to find a place to belong, for your sake and for mine. May we go forth in this assurance. May we discover joy in our labors as we travel together. And may we come to know the boundless hope of a God who is in the business of making all things possible. For this, and for your partnership in these labors, I say thanks be to God, and Amen.